I'm excited about all that God is doing as we walk through these things and we kick this off at uh, the beginning of the year with this theme, All In. And then we talked about being all in in prayer and all in in discipleship. And now, like last year, we walked through the book of Ephesians. This year, we're going to walk through the book of James. And so today, I want to kick that off. I want there to be an overview of what God is saying to us uh, personally and corporately through the book of James. So today, we're going to go all in through James. And I hope that you're challenged by that. And I want to just begin, I don't typically do this at the beginning, but I just want to pray over this time together because I, I want God to speak to us through his word this morning. So pray with me. Father, I thank you for the gift of your word, that it reveals who you are to us. And I pray that you would speak to us through the book of James. I pray that you would challenge our hearts and our lives and who we are in you and who you are for us. I pray that you would speak to us this morning as we go all in through James. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to just jump right in. If you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in uh, the book of James. That shouldn't surprise you at this point. Uh, we're going to James chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to kick it off right there at the top. And it says this, James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So James kicks this off. And one of the most amazing things that I, I think about the, the nature and character of God, one of the most incredible things about the nature and character of God is that in the bigger picture of everything, he has this macro view of all of his creation. He knows the temperature of every sun in every solar system across every universe in the entire expanse of the ever-expanding space. That's God. Now, I just read earlier this week about a, uh, there was a star that exploded and created the most massive supernova that NASA has ever seen. And God has been watching them forever. He is so big. He knows so much that our infinite mind, our finite mind, can't wrap its brain around what infinity really looks like. And yet God is eternal. Now, when we think about eternal, we typically think about eternal being like from this point on forever. But eternity really means not only into the future, but it also means forever into the past. And God has been in both directions always. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's this huge, incredible, infinite God that we have been worshiping and singing to and talking about this morning. But at the same time, this amazing magnitude of the creator God has also this micro view. And he has dialed into you personally. He knows you specifically. Think about that. The macro God knows you directly. In fact, Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 12, verse 7. Why, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not. Think about that. Jesus says, I know you so intimately. The Father knows you so well that even the hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. Now I'm looking around and some of you are saying, well, that's not that hard. <laughs> and not a whole lot to count there. <laughs> what, what Jesus is saying from this is not how much hair you have. He's saying that God knows you personally. He knows you back when you did have hair. And he knew the count then. And he knew you through every stage of, should I shave it or comb it over or what's going to happen now? And he knows you when you decided to go all in Chrome Dome and that was okay. And he was with you then. And he knows every single detail of your life. He knows every, he knew when number 412 fell out and he knew 413 was right behind it. He knew every detail. He is dialed into you. In fact, Psalm says it this way. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. 
God is so dialed into you. He knows your hairs. He knows your days. Psalm 139 goes on to say he knows your steps. He knows the words you're going to say before you do. He knows you. He's dialed into you. He cares for you. And what I want you to see from the book of James as we go through this this year, in Ephesians, when we walk through Ephesians, it was all about who God is, his infinite plan, the master plan that he has, the blueprint of what he's doing, that he chose you and he called you to belong to this family and that out of that he redeemed you and he empowered you with the spirit and he put you into a body so that you could have purpose and and a place and you would belong to a family and that out of that each woman have its own necessary and separate place so that all the family, all of us together would be healthy and we'd all be growing and we'd all be full of love because we're called to preserve the unity of all of us and all throughout Ephesians. It's about us. It's about this body. It's about all of this. And James is the other side of that, that God cares about you personally, individually. Receive the truth of who God is for you specifically. As we walk through this this year, I want you to read this very personally that this is written to the churches, but it's described in the wording. And we're going to call this out in detail over the course of this year, how God is speaking to you individually. And so as we look at this theme, all in, we're being called to all go in, but we're being called individually to be all in. It is a corporate word, but it's also a very, very personal thing. This is about us knowing that's not just about all of us. It's a very personalized interest that God has in you specifically. In fact, Psalm 1611 goes on to say, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You make known to me the path of life, that in your presence, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand is pleasure forever. That's what Psalm 16 says. Now, how many of you grew up in church? Anybody grew up in church? Yeah? Yeah, good, good scattering of you. Yeah, me too. Uh, I did. And, uh, and, and here's what I learned growing up in church. Now, I don't knock the church I went to in any way. I'm talking about this is what I got out of it. It's a personal thing. I got out of it that God is a begrudging submission smiter that if I step out of line, he's going to start warming up the lightning bolts. And if I don't get back in line quick, the smite is coming. Don't be happy. Quit your grinning. God is serious and he's holy. And this is not about fun. This is about suffering and pain for 85 years. And then we'll go to be to heaven. Like that's, that was the understand that sounds really harsh, but I'm just telling you that's where, really, that's where my heart was. But that's not, Psalm 1611 says that he shows us the path of life, that that's not a begrudging submission, that, that he shows that in his presence is fullness of joy. How, how is that the, the electrified smiter, like warming up in the back room, we're going to plug that thing in. How, how is that God? And yet, Jesus goes on to say, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. What God is after, what he's trying to do is he's trying to lead you into the deepest, most richest life possible. He's trying to show you the way into the deepest, most meaningful, most purposeful, most filled with peace, most filled with joy, most fulfilling life possible. And when he shows you the path of life, when you walk that path with him, you find Jesus there. And Jesus in his presence is fullness of joy. And you experience pleasure forever. That's what he's calling us to. How does, he, how does he do that? How does he lead us down this path? Throughout the book of James, you're going to see 
two things happening over and over and over again. Two ways that we're being called into this path. And I want to show them to you this morning so that as you read the book of James, you'll say, oh, that's one. Oh, that's the other one. The first one uh, is the primary. And the second one is the secondary. So it's really hard to follow but the first one is very primary, and the second one being second makes it very secondary, but also necessary because it's connected to the primary, right? So what is this? How does he show us? How does he do this Psalm 16, John 10? How does he show us this path of life that we have life more abundantly? What does that look like? And this first one, the primary way that he leads us in this life is that he reveals to us who he is, that he reveals to us all that he's about, the person and character and nature of God. He unpacks that to us in a thousand different ways because I was made, you were made individually, personally, very intentionally. You were made to experience and worship a relationship with God. And what happens is that we, we look to that and we, we desire to fill that void with every other kind of promise and pleasure and fulfillment. And what happens is that those things turn to ash because the promises of this world are fragile and frail. And eventually they'll fail you. And the world says, no, what you need to do is you need to get a husband and then life will be better. Or you need to get a wife and then that'll be like, answer your problems. And, and then you say, well, no, that didn't quite work. So you just need to add some kids to the equation and that'll kind of support that little structured thing you got. Now you've got a happy family. Well, no, what you really need, the one part you are forgetting there is you need to get a job. So that helps. You can pay for all that stuff. Uh, so if you just get a lot more money, then no, okay. So just, you know, you just need another level up. Just keep leveling up. Just keep leveling up. And what happens is that never really fulfills because the things that you're, none of those things are bad. All of those things are good things. The challenge is they're not ultimate things. And when you take a good thing and you make it the ultimate thing and it's not made to support the weight of filling the purpose and the reason why you're here, it fails and it falls and it leaves you empty. It doesn't quite fill that void and God steps in and the primary way that he leads us into this path of life is that he shows us and reveals to us who he is. What you and I need more than anything else in life is to behold the glory of God and who he really is to us and for us. And when we do that, when we understand that, then it changes everything. In fact, the Bible itself, you know, if you grew up in church, you probably were told that this is the roadmap to life, that this is the way that you find all of that. And, and I'm not going to knock that completely. I mean, I do have some maps back here that kind of show me like Jerusalem and stuff, but, but this is not written as a path for me. It's written as a story about who God is. It's revealing, its primary purpose is to reveal to me the nature and character of God and who he is. And as I dive into that, then I discover the path that I'm just connecting to who he is. And that leads me into this path of life. And so the primary way that God shows us this path is that he reveals to us who he is. And we call that salvation. But the Holy Spirit draws us to himself. And he reveals to us the person and nature and work of Jesus Christ. And that through that man who was fully God and fully man, who died on the cross for my sin and for yours, that through that I was made right with God. And in that right relationship, I now have a totally different perspective on life. I'm no longer trying to just make it. I'm now a son or a, you're now a daughter. And in that relationship with God, we experience the mercy and grace of God so that we can begin to walk in that path of life. That's salvation. And it's open to all of us as we step into it and God reveals who he is to us. And that's the primary way that God leads us into this path. And there's a secondary way that's also very necessary. 
And that second way is that God gives us the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots. Now, I know you're thinking, wait a minute, you just said God's not a smiter. So why are you go immediately to rules and regulations and rituals? Now, you just said that he's going to show us all this stuff, and that was really pretty and awesome, and, you know, everything is going to be great because God's going to reveal to you who he is, and you're going to find this path of life, and now you go to rules. What? Well, let me tell you something about all these things that God shows to us, the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots. The reason why these are so critical is that what God is doing every time he gives you a command or something to do, he's urging and wooing and showing and prompting you, this is the path of life. Every time God says, this is what you should do, he's trying to show you the way. And every time God says, thou shalt not, he's not trying to rob you of anything. He's protecting you lovingly. Now, I get it. I know. I mean, just told you. I grew up thinking God was this massive smiter. So in my own Christian experience growing up in life, I thought, well, God, you're just giving me all these rules because you want to rob the fun out of this world. You want to just take every temporary pleasure that we have available and just strip those out so that we're just monotone drones. That's what we're supposed to look like. And the reality is that Jesus is saying, I came to give you life, real life. And now in my adult experience, you know, the 14, 15, 16 year old John just saw a bunch of rules that I had to live by that were really killing my buzz. You know what I'm saying? And now as an adult, I look back and I realize the wisdom of what Jesus was doing and the pain and the hurt and the things that I've had to walk out healing that Jesus was trying to save me from all along. You talk about making an Ebenezer, making a, a memorial stone. I told you my story a few weeks ago. If you didn't hear that, I won't go through it. Go watch it online. But there is a place at the encounter retreat that I go to every time we have an encounter. There's a little point on the Fort Gibson Lake that I go to, and if the rocks aren't standing, I stack them back up because that is where I was touched. It's where I was healed. It's where God became really real, where I believe. And that's my marker. That's my memorial. That's the place that I go and I go there. I get to go there twice a year and just hang out there. Just If the storms of life have knocked those stones over, I stack them back up, and I'll pray there again. And that's how God works in us, and he calls us to this. He's not trying to rob you of anything. He's trying to reveal this path of life to you so that you can experience real glory real what it looks like to follow in this path. I mean, think about it. If, if you were to ask me, John, you know, uh, tell me about marriage. And, and I said to you, well, you know, I made some promises, so I got to fulfill those. I got I to gotta keep those. You'd be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah, you know, I've been dreaming of my whole life about finding someone I just sort of kind of like and then kind of just hanging out there for a while because I'm stuck there forever. I'm just following these promises and commitments that I made. Like that's not marriage, but if you came to me for real and you said, John, tell me about marriage. And I, I began to, where do I even begin to talk about Steph? And I recount the joy of who she is to me. And I think about how God works in her and how God works through her in me all the time. And, uh, and then you're like, yeah, I want some of that. Get, yeah, sign me up because that's what God is after. He's not after, here's some promises I got to keep and something you got to begrudgingly submit to. It's about revealing the real purpose and glory of who he is. And all through James, we're going to see this, this primary is salvation and the secondary is obedience. It's walking out what that looks like. And James puts it in these words. He says, one is faith by grace that you have been saved through faith. And the other is 
works. It's the faith that produces obedience. It's the works that come out of our faith. One is primary. I must have the faith to step into the secondary, which is also necessary to show what God has done in me. And that's the works, the obedience that produces in my life. And you're going to see this recurring theme punch it in on replay just over and over and over throughout the book of James. Faith without works is dead and useless. And that's the theme of our year as we're going all in, that faith without works is useless and dead. And our faith, all in faith, is active and alive. And that's who we're called to be. And we'll see this throughout James. And I want to ask you to be looking for it and praying through it. And as you read through this book to see it for yourselves. In fact, I'll I'll challenge you to this. It takes about 15, 16 minutes typically to read, for me to read through the book of James. So it's five chapters. It's not that big of a a book. It's not that long. And it's very, very, very practical. In fact, it's often been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. You know, we, we didn't really challenge, we did challenge you to read through Ephesians, but we didn't challenge you to read it often. In fact, I can put the Bible app on and I, when I leave my house, I can play the audio version of James and it finishes by the time I get here. It takes me about 15, 16 minutes to get here. So I can listen to the whole book. I've done it several times. And I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you this year to read through the book of James at least once a month. Can we do that? 15 minutes that we can read through the book of James together once a month. And here's what's going to happen. You do that. You can go ahead and start that. You got like five days left this month. So you can carve out 15 minutes and make that happen. And what's going to happen is that over the course of 12 times of reading this through, it's going to start to get in you. It's going to start to work in you a little bit. And you're going to be caught when you begin to say that thing that you really wanted to fire back at that person. And James says, if you can control your tongue, you're like, oh yeah. And you're going to be, want to, to show favoritism or partiality to one person over another. And James is going to remind you that, that we're called to be different. And you're going to want to go after worldly pleasure and you're going to want to find your peace and your hope in something that's temporal. And James is going to remind you, your life is a mist and a vapor. Trust in God, not in stuff. And these things are going to start to work in you, and you're going to read that over and over 12 times this year. I want to challenge you to do that. Can you do that? Anybody want to sign up for that? Yeah, let's do it together, okay? I know that Ephesians was difficult because it was a really heavy book. You know, you've got lots of deep theology there, and we're talking about God's eternal plan for all of history and the world, and, and he's dealing with a lot of big stuff and spiritual warfare and all these massive things going on, and so it's hard to chew on that over and over and over, and you really need to break that down and take it in smaller bites. But James, we can just absorb, just put it on and by osmosis, just get it all, okay? I want you to do that with us. And so as we turn to look at the book of James, James chapter one, verse one, I have a pop quiz question for you. Who wrote the book of James? Anybody? Anybody? Who wrote the book of James? James. Good. If you said Paul, I'm just going to be done. Like I'm out. Forget it. I'm done. (laughs) No, it's good. Yes, James wrote the book of James. That's very good. Glad you're with us. Thank you for joining. It's 11 o'clock service in Claremore. It's really good because James wrote this book, and it's interesting because James is actually the half-brother of Jesus. It's interesting because all the evidence to the fact points to the reality that James, as the half-brother of Jesus, was not a believer in Jesus. This is interesting. I mean, you think about it, like you just expect anybody that's around Jesus to begin to follow him, right? Unless your like last name ends in Pharisee, then you'd expect them to just tow right along with Jesus. But he didn't. James, the half brother of Jesus, didn't believe in Jesus at all. And, And that's, you know, probably if you dive into it a little bit deeper, it's probably not that surprising because, you know, if you're half brother, you don't really tend to believe them if your half brother claims to be deity. Like that's just... Not something, I have several half-brothers and none of them have claimed to be the son of God, but if they were, I would discount that. I would, I would have to think twice about doing anything that would put my life on the line 
because my half-brother says he's the son of God in the flesh. And so in John chapter 7, we see this, and it says, in, chap- in John chapter 7, verse 2 through 5, it says, Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea. In other words, why don't you go away? <laughs> that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Important to point out here. He says that your disciples, because we're not them, <laughs> okay? So why don't you go to where your disciples are because it ain't here, brother? And he says, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, if you really are who you say you are, if you really can do these things, then show yourself to the world. And then it says, for not even his brothers believed him. Now, this is Jesus about to launch into the real full effect of personal ministry and life and walking through the path that God had for him to the cross. And I want to point out here that maybe you're like me growing up. Maybe you have grown up in the church and you've, you've walked with the Christian tradition and you've heard about God your entire life, but you've never really seen him. That's James. He lived, shared, probably maybe shared a bedroom with the son of God growing up. They probably had to trade shoes every now and then. He was right there, intimately connected, and he never saw God. And you can grow and you can go through all of the rules and the rituals and the traditions and the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, and you can do the right stuff and miss Jesus. You can see him without really seeing him. James did. And it goes on to say, one instance where the half-brothers of Jesus showed up to seize him because they thought that he was going insane. In fact, in Mark chapter 3, it says, Then he went home, Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. I mean, think about this. Uh, They wanted to send him away, right? Right? John chapter 7, why don't you go away out there? And instead, now Jesus has brought it personal. He's brought it home with him. He's come home to it, and now they can't even do their normal stuff at home because this crowd is mobbing them. And they go out and they go to grab him and seize him because they say, you need to be institutionalized. This is getting out of hand. And they bring him in. And here's what I want you to see out of this, that Maybe you have a brother or a sister. Maybe you have a spouse or a son or a daughter who doesn't believe. This is James, chapter 1, verse 1, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That even when your family doesn't believe, you can have faith for them. You can believe for them because God has a plan and a purpose and he opens the call to all. God desires that everyone would come to a saving knowledge of the truth. The call is open. Continue to pray because God has a specific plan and a purpose. And even though James didn't see it and he thought Jesus was out of his mind, he's still the one that says, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no evidence that James ever followed Jesus at all during his earthly ministry, all the way up to his death. In John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, it says, but standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. His own brothers didn't go to Jesus' crucifixion. If if they had been there, he would have said, Hey, James, look after Ma, will you? But he didn't. He turned to the disciple John, whom he loved, and he said, You're going to have to take care of her because my brothers are deserted. They're not here. And he never 
believed. He never followed Jesus all the way up to the crucifixion. And yet, and yet, here's my favorite part of this story. Three chapters later, you got to turn the page and get into Acts. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and when they entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. He believed. James believed. So what happened? What was the, what was the thing that made the shift there? In Acts chapter 15, we see that James has now risen to a position of, of authority in the Jerusalem church. In fact, the apostles come to him and they look to him to settle this, this issue that they're talking about and discussing. And James stands up in Acts chapter 15 and says, this is what we should do. And they all agree in one accord, that's what we should do. So he's leading this church. In fact, he believes in this so much that he goes all in with his faith. And he's martyred for it so that because he has risen to a place of leadership in the early church, the church has grown to 18, 20,000 people. And the, the Sanhedrin calls him and says, why don't you address this crowd and, uh, and let us kind of put this thing to rest because it's kind of getting out of hand. This is, not, uh, this is according to uh, church historians. I want to point that out. It's not necessarily, this is church history now, Okay. But they take him up there and the Sanhedrin says, let's go up to this highest pinnacle of the temple where you can really address the crowd from here. And as he begins to talk to them, they were hoping he would kind of settle things down a little bit because this is Jesus' half-brother. Surely he knows like some stories he can tell of when Jesus was a kid and you know, like they stole some candy or something. Like, let's squelch, let's squelch this thing. Squelch, that's an oaky word. Squelch, squash, squelch. Thank you, love. Okay, good. Yeah. So he wanted to put this to rest. Well, here's what happens. He gets up there and he goes full on evangelist mode and starts preaching to the crowd of 20,000 people. And the Sanhedrin doesn't like that a little much. They give him the little old shoulder bump trick and he goes falling 60 feet to the floor below. And then the mob rushes him and they begin to beat him. And one of the launderers picks up a club that he's been using to beat out the laundry and he bashes in his head. And while he's there being stoned and beaten and dying at the foot of the temple, the same pinnacle where Jesus was taken by the enemy and he denied. And Jesus said, by bread alone, not by bread alone, but by the very word of God, that by that same pinnacle that Jesus was there with Satan and he denied the tempter, he was fallen to his death. And as he was laying there on the floor, being beaten and clubbed and dying for believing in his half-brother Jesus, being who he said he was, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. What was the transition? What made him go from, Jesus, you are out of your mind, to, I believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, the thing that Jesus did, that made James change his mind. Jesus came back to life. Resurrection from the dead. Typically, when your half-brother says, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be dead for three days, and I'm going to come back, that's the end of the story. But when you actually do it, it changes things a little bit. And Paul writes and says, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. James specifically. He could have said he appeared to the brothers or he appeared to the family or he appeared to the group of the early church, but it says he appeared to James specifically because Jesus wanted his half-brother to know. And he cares this isn't just about us being all in. It's personal. God has a specific interest and a care for you individually. As we read through the book of James, I want you to see this and I want you to understand that being all in is a very personal step of faith. We're going to walk through 
this book of James. We're going to be called to be all in as Christians that understand God's perspective of trials and perseverance. We're going to be challenged to be all in as doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. We're going to be challenged to be all in, to not show favoritism or partiality. Challenged to be all in, to show our faith through our obedience and our works. We're going to be challenged to be all in, to tame our tongue and to be submitted to God and to others with true humility. We're going to be challenged to be all in, to avoid worldliness and pursue godliness to be challenged to be all in with a godly perspective of life. That we're called to be patient and suffering and we're called to prayer, to a life of prayer and to reaching out and saving a lost and saving a brother back from death. So this is a very personal faith. And I want you to know, that as you read through James, we do this together 12 times this next year, 15 minutes, just reading through this book, it will speak to you. I want you to see these three reoccurring themes. Number one, suffering never surprises God. He's never surprised. In fact, he uses it for his purposes. James says in chapter five, an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Suffering never surprises God. He never wastes a hurt. He never wastes a pain. There's always purpose in the middle of what he's doing. God is not an ambulance driver. He does not show up after the wreck and triage the situation and try to put the pieces back together. He's never late. He's working and he's moving. And you can trust him. Job himself said in chapter 42, at the end of the book, when everything else was done, he had been through this entire scenario that we read through Job last year as daily Bible reading. Job says, hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now, now my eyes see you. That's what it looks like. That's what happened to James. He had heard Jesus. He had seen Jesus in operation. But then after the resurrection, everything changed. Now he really sees Jesus. And there's never a moment that God does not see you, that he's not there with you, that he's not walking through it with you because suffering never surprises God. And number two, this recurring theme, I want you to see that God is about progress, not perfection. James is going to show us that we all have room to grow. It's a very practical book. It's often been called the Proverbs of the New Testament because it shows us day by day how there are things in life that we still need to grow in. You could grow to be 85 years old and you'll read James and you'll look at it and you'll go, man, I'm not there yet. I read this just this last week, reading through James, and I'm looking at that and going, there are times when my tongue gets me in trouble. There are times when I show favoritism or partiality. There are times when I look to the world for comfort and I look to stuff to please, and I don't look to God. There are times when I don't want to submit to God. There are times when I don't want to be all in. And James makes it really clear. It's going to challenge all of us. But what God is saying is, it's not about a life, the path of life that I'm showing you. The, it's in my presence, there's fullness of joy. He doesn't say that once you get to the end of the path, you'll find fullness of joy. He says, in my presence, when you go on the path of life that Jesus calls us to, you walk with Jesus on the path. And it's with him in his presence where you find the fullness of joy. The pleasures are at his right hand with him. It's about progress, not perfection. We'll never be perfect enough to get to the end of that. But we can. In every step of faith, there's movement forward. And God is calling us to that. It's faith and works. Faith and obedience over and over and over through James. And finally, this recurring theme. But the constant pull of the world is that riches and comfort will satisfy. And that pull 
is always a lie. No matter what you try to plug into that hole, no matter what idea you have or thing you strive for, it's always going to leave you short because God is the only one who can truly satisfy and he's urging and he's prompting and he's calling us into this. Just yesterday, we went shopping. Uh, we went to Walmart. That's a great place to go. I'm sure you've been there. And uh, Shepard got some money for Christmas and uh, he calls them his bucks. And so he's got his bucks and his little camouflage zipper uh, Velcro wallet. He's carrying it around with him all day long. We had some other errands to run and he can't wait to get to Walmart because he's got his bucks in his pocket and they're burning a hole in his pocket, right? He can't wait to get there. So we're going to Walmart, right? Five times. We're going to Walmart, right? The next stop, is that, is that Walmart? No, not the next one, buddy, but we'll get there. Okay, okay. He can't wait. Now, I told Steph, we're walking through the store. I said, this is hard for me because it's his money and I want him to experience like the, all of that. You know exactly what I mean. Like he's going to buy this thing and it's going to break in like three days and then he's going to be left with nothing and you know, we're going to throw it away in like two years. We'll have pieces lying around that I'll step on for a couple of days, right? That's how this works. And I know that that's going to happen, but I want him to experience all of that. We want to show him the what's, you know, this is what we do. This is, and we also want to explain the why's. And I, I don't want to be the, because I told you so, that's why. Like sometimes they force our hand and we just got to go there. But, but most of the time we try to just be like open to about what's going on and why God wants us to do these things. And, and I look at that and Shepard really wants this thing and he's six and it's his bucks that he wants to get it with. And I'm 40 and I'm looking at that going, okay, <laughs> all right, yeah, do what you're gonna do and you know, you'll learn. And in James, what we're gonna see over and over and over is that we are 40 or 17 or 55 or whatever it is and God who is eternal and infinite, macro and dialed in micro going this is the way. Come on. Come this way. This is the path towards purpose. This is the path towards peace. This is the path towards all that I have for you. Life more abundantly in the fullness of joy. This is the way. Come this way. Faith and obedience working together. And that's what we'll see through the book of James. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this word that you've given to us, the book of James, that we are challenged to go all in. I pray that this year we would be stepping into an understanding of what it really looks like to live our faith out loud. That we, as we have sung and declared, we believe in you. You have revealed yourself to us. We've heard you, but now we see you and we believe. And because of that belief, because of our faith, we put it to action. We go all in, just like James. And we say, you are our Lord and our God, that we are servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would help us to take those steps to walk it out in faith and obedience, putting our faith to legs and having works that reveal all that you've called us to, that we would be all in through James. In Jesus' name, amen.